Hello YouTube, this is Edward, and welcome to A Beginner's Guide to the Unix Command Line. In this crash course, I will be teasing apart the fundamentals of Unix and its commands, everything from navigation to file manipulation to basic permissions. I'd like to note that while this video is targeted towards beginners, I've included in the description a timeline of sorts in which you can go at this video at your own pace. You can jump around and find topics that are interesting to you. All right, let's get started. Now, I'll leave the history of Unix to another video, but I will briefly touch the surface of it just because it's incredibly fascinating and has relevance to the operating system, systems we use today. So at the time Unix was first developed, in the late 60s and early 70s, computers looked like, looked like this. So we have a teletypewriter passing input and receiving output on these printed pieces of paper. There's no monitor, no mouse like we have today. Like I said, th these machines were slow, comparatively, they were expensive and large. So these constraints led to some nuances in the Unix uh, design. Specifically, we can see the Unix philosophy arise at this time. And this is basically the idea that this operating system is made up of modular commands. They're commands that do one thing, and when combined, we'll see how to do that in this, in this video, they can perform some incredibly uh, powerful and complex functions. All right, real quick, this is Unix's family tree. It shows how the original Unix system, developed in the late 60s, early 70s, has diverged, been adapted, remerged, diverged again to form a variety of operating systems, some of which have persisted until today. And they all have these roots in Unix. So namely, we'll see Mac OS and Linux, and you might recognize that Windows, in fact, is not included on this chart because Windows is not based on Unix. So if you're following along on a Windows system, some of the commands will be different, simply because it's not based on Unix. So I recommend installing a Linux distribution. Also, link in the description for that. I assume that up to this point, at least most of you have been operating within a GUI, or a graphical user interface. That is, you have a mouse pointer, you can move it around, you can click on different buttons, perform a variety of commands. You can click on a folder, for instance. You can X out of that folder, or that, of that window. You can X out of this other window. You can check your battery life, etc. So the idea that I really want to get across to you is that when we're, when we're doing the command line, we're performing the same kind of communication. We're communicating with our computer just through text instead. Let's segue into a demo. I'm going to open up my finder, or it's a, basically a file explorer or navigator, and I'm going to navigate to my desktop. So really what I want to get across to you in this demo is the idea of directories. Directory, directories are basically uh, containers. So I'm located on my desktop, or my desktop directory. It's a container of these files. Also, by extension, we'll see that this, uh, for example, this diary folder on my desktop, if we open it up, it's also a directory that contains other files, including subfiles or subdirectories. Uh, so open up this diary test, it'll contain two subfiles. Uh, when we're navigating through our directories and text, you want to kind of keep this hierarchy in mind. So, for example, so in the same way, that your parent kind of contained you, <laughs> and think about it that way, um, this is a parent to all of its children, basically from here to here. And for example, this diary test is a parent to its children. And this child has a parent of diary tests. Now, think back to that demo. I was always working within a directory, that is, one time I was on my desktop directory, I was, that was the lowest level directory at the time. I was manipulating things within that directory. Then I would navigate, for example, for instance, that diary folder within the desktop directory. That was my lowest directory at the time. I was working within that directory. This is, if this doesn't make sense now, that's fine. It's going to become more uh, concrete soon. This diagram here is basically a model of how directories are laid out within the Unix system. So at the top of all Unix directories is the root directory. It's the parent uh, directory or container of all other directories. 
So it's always represented by this forward slash. And whenever you want to specify where a file is in Unix, you give it a path. We'll get more to this later. For instance, if we want to navigate to where I was before, I would navigate down to my users directory, then my name, Edward, and then the desktop directory where I had further subdirectories. So you know how on your, on your computer, you might have different users logging in. For example, yourself, your dad might have a different user, your accounts are different. So that's that uh, split that we see here. All right, so let's open up our shells. A shell is, in its simple broad terms, any type of user interface that allows you to interact with your computer, and it's usually through the form of text. So on Mac and Linux, you're, you can open, open up your command line or shell using the terminal application. You can also navigate it through using the spotlight. Cool, so uh, my uh, type of shell is called a bash. Yours is likely the same. It's most commonly used. A bash is sp specifically a type of shell. It's a program that is a type of shell. Sometimes you hear those two terms used interchangeably, and neither of them is in fact wrong, but a bash is a little bit more specific. All right, so no worries if your uh, shell looks slightly different from mine. I just have a special configuration that causes it to look like this. But something that should remain the same is at the beginning of each uh, prompt line, we'll see our present working directory. In this case, it's our a tilde representing our home directory. So if you go back to that diagram that I had pulled up here, the home directory is one level down from the user's directory. It might be your name or your user. For me, it's Edward. We can confirm this by running the command pwd for present working directory. Now we're one step down from the users, and this forward slash separates the two directories, users and my username. Now let's get a taste of some more commands. So one way to look up the list of all different commands that are available to you is, just, is to click on the tab button on your shell, or on the keyboard in your shell. And then when prompted for all the possibilities, so I'll click Y when, when prompted for yes. And here we're given our, the thousands, <laughs> or almost 2,000 uh, methods or commands that are given to me. So we saw these, but we don't really know what any of them mean. So let's pick one out randomly. Don't recommend doing that. <laughs> but let's try it out. So ls. So cool. Uh, I mean, I don't really know what that did. So one way to look that up is to look in the manual. So we can run a command called man and give it, pass it the command ls. And it'll give us a documentation of sorts about the ls command. So the command will see what it does. We just list the directory contents. That's simple enough. And then there's a more technical description here. Pass over there for now. And then we see a list of options. So these are often referred to as flags. They're parameters we can pass to commands to make them behave in certain ways. We can alter, we can use a combination of different flags to make it behave. Let's, let's just pick out one. For example, uh, this L, this L flag. Let's see what, read what it does. It lists in long format. Cool, so let's quit out of this using the Q, Q button. Then let's run LS with that flag. So we, we attach flags after commands. And we, we begin the list of uh, flags using a dash. We can attach we can attach another flag if we wanted to, just like that. But let's just stick with the L flag, and we'll see how this flag altered the running of this ls command. So we'll see we have some permissions here. We won't go into all the details until the end of the video. Then we have the user. We have the size of it, the date of when it was modified, and then the name itself. Okay, so now let's take a look at directories in the context of the command line. So to recap from before, directories are just containers, and we are always within a container or directory. So currently, we're located in our home directory, and we can recognize that using the print working directory command, and we can see the contents of the directory. But now let's say we want to make a directory, equivalent to making a folder in the GUI. We use the command mkdir for make directory, and then just call it, uh, we can say YouTube. That file already exists. <laughs> oh, oops. Uh, let's think of another one. Uh, make directory uh, Coke for Coca Cola. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so if we list again, we'll see that Coca-Cola is listed as a uh, folder or directory. So you'll notice that we're still, we haven't moved to that directory. We're still in our home directory. But we can move into that directory using the change directory command, cd. So cd Coca-Cola. And say we don't, we don't really want to type the rest of the, the name, we can just click on tab. It'll autocomplete, assuming there's uh, it's a unique string, right? So if I had Coca-Cola 2, and that wouldn't have worked because there would have been two options. So let's navigate into that Coca-Cola, into the directory. We'll notice our prompt has changed now. We are now located within the Coca-Cola directory. Now, if we ever want to go back to our home directory, there's a shortcut just to, um, and that is to just type in cd with no uh, parameters, and that'll take us back to our home directory. Now let's go back into that Coca-Cola uh, directory. And another way of going to that home directory, an alternative way to do it, is to use the dot notation. So what I mean by that is to type two dots, and two dots means move up one directory, move to the direct parent of the current directory. So if I do that, that'll work. Um, another command, let's do that one more time, let's use the up arrow, and uh, kind of a redundant command, uh, kind of, and it is an extension of the dot, no, dot notation, is to just put one dot, and that just means the current directory. And see, it doesn't have any effect here, we're just moving to the current directory, which has no effect. But sometimes you want to use this when you want to select the entire directory, or when you're using it in a path name. So something that's really cool about the command line is you can, you can perform operations really quickly. For example, say I want to make two directories or two folders within the Coca-Cola directory. I can run, let's see, let's take um, Sprite and Fanta. So I'm creating two folders. I separate them by a space. They're counted as uh, two arguments to that command. Actually, let's put a third one. Um, root beer. Cool. So I just made three uh, directories in one command or one line. <laughs> That's, that's pretty cool. And of course, we can confirm this change using the ls command. So we have three different directories. And also, we can further confirm by, uh, let's see, going into our graphical finder. Let's see, users, any Aussie. So we made that in our YouTube folder. Let's see if it was another, oh, we changed it to Coca-Cola, right? And then we have three folders or directories. Cool, we have directories. Let's create some plain text files. So how do we do that? So the command is called touch, and then we just give the name of some files. And similarly, we can pass multiple arguments. So let's do that. Let's put maybe um, sa1.txt, sa2, let's make that a markdown file. It's a, another type of text file. And then um, sa3, and let's make that a Microsoft Word document. <laughs> cool, so we have three documents here. We have three documents pretty quickly from ls, we have our three documents and three directories. But say SA2 was caught for plagiarism and we want to delete it. The way we do that, just run the rm command, remove, and um, oh, see, see what I completed here, auto-completed here, and there were multiple options, so it didn't work. But it gave me the options, so let's do that. Let's remove the SA2, we can confirm that it was deleted. Now let's say I changed my mind, I don't like Fanta anymore. So let's remove that. Oh wait, we got this error saying that Fanta is a directory. The way we have to do this is to run, or is to pass a flag to the remove command, and that is the remo remove r, standing for recursively. So remove this directory and all of its contents, basically, recursively. So let's pass Fanta in, and we'll see Fanta is gone. Cool. Okay, so let's clean up this directory, this Coca-Cola directory a little bit. So I don't like these plain text files just out here alone, not grouped into directories. So let's move the, both of these essays into the root beer directory. So we do this is we use the move command, and the two arguments we pass are one, the source, and two, the destination. So in other words, where the document is now and where we want to move it to. So since it's in the current directory, we can just say essay one. Let's see, we got the to complete there. I'm going to move it into the root beer directory, for example. Cool. So we run ls. It's not there anymore. We move into root beer. ls. It is there. So let's move this sa1.txt root from the root beer directory to a directory above. 
Now in doing this, I'm going to introduce some, a distinction between relative paths and absolute paths. Let's start with relative paths. So we can always write in terms of where we are currently. We're always within a current, recall that we're always within a current working directory. In this case, the root beer. So let, let's, let's move that command to move up, right? So we're gonna move up, we're gonna move the sa1.txt. And notice that I didn't have any, I didn't have a directory in front of this sa1.txt. For example, I didn't write root beer forward slash sa1.txt because I'm already within the root beer directory. It's relative, relative to itself, right? So it's assumed. Now I want to move up relative to the root beer directory. So recall, now I'm within the Coca-Cola directory. And then I want to move within that directory. So I'll put a forward slash. I can, I can click tab to see what my options are. Let's say I want to move into the sprite directory. I'll type in sprite and then press enter. Cool. So let's move up that directory to confirm that change was made. Now we're in a Coca-Cola directory. We can ls to list and move into the sprite and then list and our essay has been moved. Wow. So the final command that I'm going to introduce to you that is related to file manipulation is copy. So recall that we're in the sprite directory. We have our uh, essay here. Let's make a copy of that essay within the current directory. So the command we use is cp for our copy. We want to copy the essay1.txt and we want to rename it as essay2.txt. So this is our uh, original file and our new file. Well, if we list out to confirm, we have two text files that are copies of each other. Now there is no rename command built into Unix, but we can achieve the same effect using the move command in a special way. So here in our spread directory, we have two different text files. Let's rename the essay1 to essay4. We'll look at how this works in a second. essay4.txt. All right. So essay1.txt was renamed to essay4.txt. In fact, effectively, you're renaming or you're, you're moving a file within your directory to a, direct, a file of a different name in the same directory, effectively renaming the file. So our text files are empty right now. We've simply initialized them using the touch command, but we haven't filled them with any content. So let's do that now. One of the ways we can do this is just to open it up in another application, so exit terminal using the open command. Let's say open SA4, for example. That also open my text editor, text edit on the Mac, maybe something different on your system. It's just the default uh, system that I have saved. But this was a little bit cumbersome, right? I had to open this file in a new window. I'm sure it works fine, but I like to stay within my terminal, right? So one of the ways we can do this is to use the VI editor, which is built into bash. So we use the VI command and then pass in the text file as an argument. And now, just kind of a forewarning, uh, this program has a steep learning curve. There are a lot of commands and seem a bit cryptic in the beginning. So the way VI works is that there are different states you can enter. For example, um, if you say we want, to insert the, we want to insert something into this document, we need to enter the insert state. So we do that by typing the I key. Now you'll see here we're in the insert state and we can start typing. Test, let's say hello, uh, this is YouTube. Now all these tildes just represent blank space. I haven't written anything to fill this document. So now we're done, now we're done inserting text. So let's click the escape key to escape the insert state. Now there's some nifty commands we can use to navigate uh, within this document. Let's go over a few of them. One of which is to use the K, uh, K, K key to move up and the J key to move down. If we type the letter U, it'll undo the changes we made. So let's enter those in real quick. Let's go back into our insert state. Hello, this is YouTube. So let's exit again, escape again, and we're back to our original state. Let's say we want to know more about VI. So we'll do that by typing the colon key and then help. Okay, so this will give us some documentation about VI, how to move around, how to close this window, how to jump to a subject. I won't go through all of it, but if you want to learn more about it, fill in that learning curve, build up your competency. This is a good place to do it. Cool, otherwise I'll also make a video, link that in the description. So now to go back, we escape to get back to kind of our main menu. 
of sorts. And then type the colon key and quit. So this will take us out of the documentation. Now let's say we're done. We've, this is the text we want. And we'll type the colon key again. And then to, we want to save this file. Otherwise, in other words, we want to write it to the file. So we'll use the W key, press enter. So now it's been written, it's been saved. Now let's exit, colon Q for quit. Sweet. And now we can confirm that uh, this text was written by using the cat command. Cat sa4.txt. This will print the text. There are also other commands. I'll display those on the screen right now. <laughs> cool. Now let's take a look at searching. When searching, we need to ask ourselves, do we want to search inside the contents of our files, or do we want to search by file name? Those are the two different, two different ways we'll usually do it. So let's actually find the files we want to search. Let's see, I, think it was, I believe it was in my sprite directory. I had, yeah, two essays. Essay 4 we edited uh, in VI. And let's search within that file. So when doing that, since we're searching inside the file, we use the grep command, G-R-E-P. And then we specify the query after that command. So let's say uh, YouTube, I believe I mentioned that keyword in that file. And then we specify the file name, which in this case was sa4.txt. Now, as we'll see here, we got our output. And the query, when found, is highlighted in a different color. And again, that might vary a little bit uh, depending on your uh, configuration. But in mind, that's how it is. But in any case, you should get the line at least in which that query was found or not. All right, so let's say we didn't know that that query, we, we didn't know to search within a specific file. Let's say we wanted to search within a directory. Let's, let's navigate up uh, one directory. Let's say we want to search the current directory for that same query. So to grep, and we'll add a flag. Again, we'll see the same flag recursively. So rec uh, recursively search through this file and all of its contents. For the query, YouTube, and then where in the current directory. So the current directory includes all of its children. Just, be, just make sure that's clear. So it'll specify, it'll give the path first. So start from the current directory, navigate down to sprite. From there, navigate down to this file. And then this is the line in which it was found, and that's the query you search for in red. OK, so the second case is when you're searching by file name. When we're doing that, we simply use the find uh, command. So let's uh, navigate back into the sprite directory. Let's say we want to search in this, let's say we want to search for the sa4.txt. So we'll do find. We'll specify where we want to search, which is in this case th this current directory. We'll s we have to give a flag of how we want to sort, which is by name, and then we want to give the the search query. We don't put it in parentheses since it's a file. Oops, actually, I say four dot text, and then it was found. Uh, again, let's say we didn't know where to search. Let's move up one directory. So we'll find in the current directory, which includes the child directory. We're searching by name. We want to search for essay for text. Great. It'll get the same results. Let's say we had even less certainty. We just wanted to search for uh, files that ended in the .txt extension. To do that, we'll do keep the same format. And instead of giving a file name, we'll use this uh, kind of wild case character, it just specifies any content and then .txt, so any file ending in .txt. And we'll get our two files. Awesome. All right, so up to this point, we've just been using standard input and output. That is, we've been inputting text or arguments into methods using our keyboard, and we've been receiving output via the console. It's being outputted or it's spit out into our bash. However, we can change this. We can modify input, standard input and output by using something called redirects. And we specify these using less than and greater than signs. So let's take a look. So let's say we run a command that would specify output. For example, the ls command. It'll, it'll print the contents of our working directory. 
let's say instead of outputting it into our uh, bash, let's redirect it. So we'll use the greater than sign. Think of it as this arrow pointing away from the command into a file. We don't have to have, we don't, it doesn't have to be created yet. It'll create it for us if we just type it in. Let's say output. Um, let's say dot text. Great. So as we'll see here, there was no output to the console because we're not using standard output anymore. And then we have a text file called output.txt. And when we view its output, when we, when we view the content of that text file, we see the content that was previously displayed on the console. Let's try this again with a different command. Let's use one of the search commands we had up here. For example, this one. Let's output it to the same file. Now let's view that file. And we'll notice, oh, first of all, what's kind of interesting here, this redirection happened after this file was created. So the search actually pick, picked up that file. It's kind of interesting. Anyway, another thing that's interesting is that when we wrote to the output.txt file the second time using that single redirect symbol, the single greater than sign, it overrode all the content we had there previously. We can change that by using a double greater than sign, which uh, just simply means uh, we want to append the output to that file. So let's demonstrate that. So let's go back to our ls. I'll just, I'll just use repeat it there. Output.txt and then cat output.txt. Got to use my arrow keys there, that's fine. And we'll see here that the ls command was just outputted, it was appended to uh, that text file. So let's take a look at manipulating standard input. That is, passing input from a source other than your keyboard into a command, which will then be outputted. We could, could also manipulate standard output, but let's just uh, isolate standard input. So in this current directory, I've created a randomized list ahead of time. It contains a list of randomized names out of order, as you can see. We'll, we'll change that soon. So there is a command in Unix called sort. Let's quickly, if I can quickly show you that. This is another way, it's an alternative to using the man pages. And basically, it won't take you into a, like a separate editor as it did you know, before you had to exit out when you were done. This will just do it in one command or one kind of go. Anyway, so let's look at let's look at some of the, the flags here. One of the flags is n uh, for numeric sort. So it's compare according to the string numeric value. In other words, alphabet alphabeticize the list. So we're going to run that command. However, it's it, let's see, it'll take an input of a, let's take, let me show you that real quick. Take an, so sort option, which, are, which is our flag, and then the file name. So we could have just typed in the name randomize a list here, but instead, let's actually pass the input from randomize a list like that. And then we get our randomized list in alphabetical order. Pretty cool. When we, when we were redirecting with the greater than and less than operators, we were redirecting between files, right? Input, changing the input and output streams. That's when you want to use uh, those greater than or less than operators. However, when you want to pass information or uh, pass data between uh, different programs and utilities, that is, take the output of one program or utility and send it to the other, to send it to another program or utility. We want to use something called piping. And this comes back to the idea that I mentioned earlier in the video of the modular uh, philosophy of Unix. That is, this system is made up of thousands of commands that do one thing, they're very specific. They do, they would do one thing that very well, but they're limited to that. However, we can combine them using pipes or pipelines, as we'll see once they become elaborate. All right, so let's take a look at an example. For example, we have the command ls to list the current, uh, list the contents of the current directory. And the way pipes work is we take the output of what's on the left and we pass it to what's on the right. Think of it as like a pipe of water just flowing this way, from left to right. So we'll take the contents of our current directory Let's say we'll sort them uh, with the numeric uh, flag. And then actually let's output this to a text file. Let's do, let's call it piping.txt. Okay, let's view that text file. 
let's make sure everything worked. So it listed the contents of a current directory, which was an unordered list of this, basically. Then those contents were passed to this sort command. The sort command sorted them alphabetically, which we see here. And the output of this was redirected. We use the greater than uh, operator because we're redirecting to a file or changing the standard output. And then finally, we uh, viewed the output of our text file. Great. So if you want to look at some more examples of piping, I encourage you to do that because this is, this is really powerful. Congratulations, you made it through my 30 minute guide to the Unix command line. My hope is now that you have a basic foundation in the Unix command line and you know how to proceed, uh, continue learning. I guess I'll give you some, some of my recommendations. If you just Google uh, Unix cheat sheet, there's a good resource here that condenses some of the information in the man pages or the manual pages. So yeah, great, a good job. Uh, if you would like to um, kind of continue with your studies in Unix, I will upload a video soon, It'll probably about by the time you're watching this, about Unix permissions, the basics of Unix permissions. It's highly interesting, so hopefully you check that out. And please subscribe, like the video, and catch you guys later.